All right, Alexander, let's talk about the sanctions, more sanctions that are going to be uh, thrown at Russia. And uh, we have the 11th sanctions package from the EU and the G7 meeting where the general uh, consensus is that there will be a, a complete block of not only Russian oil, but from what I understand, all kinds of uh, of Russian uh, commodities and and goods, um, with the exception of of a few ones that the United States uh, is going to going to decide on. So I mean, it, it, it looks like you're just getting to a complete embargo blockade of of trade with Russia. That's that's the way it's it's looking to be. Yes, which. Uh comes directly, of course, after there's been a whole slew of, of reports now. Um, we discussed this recently. British media sanctions have been a joke. They've completely failed. Russia's economy has reoriented to the east. Um, China has stepped in. India has stepped in. Most of the world isn't supporting the sanctions. And yet, nonetheless, we just press on. <laughs> and we press on. And on and on. And of course, we cause more problems for ourselves because, of course, we're now going to try and stop all exports of Russian oil entirely, apparently imports rather, of Russian oil entirely into the EU. Who is that causing the major problems to? Now, uh, I was reading um, an article again in the British media by a man called Liam Halligan, who's one of the first people last year, by the way, to say that uh, the West was heading for double-digit inflation. I say one of the first people in the mainstream media, we were saying that long before, and he was saying that, you know, it's impossible to impose these kind of sanctions on Russia without having double-digit inflation. He was giving warnings that we're heading in exactly the same direction again. We seem to be imposing more uh, sanctions that are going to disrupt supply line, supply um, even further. But that's what we're going to do. <laughs> I don't know what to say, uh, honestly. Um, how badly is this going to hurt Europe? Well, it's going to hurt Europe a lot. Uh, again, uh, going back to what Liam Halligan was saying, he makes he makes the point that already, uh, we, I mean, we talk, I guess, it's, we're, we're, we're simply going over territory that you and I discussed, well, over a year ago when the sanctions were first imposed, that uh, he makes the point that German industry, and, you know, Germany has this big manufacturing sector, German industry is now becoming increasingly uncompetitive because it's paying higher energy costs than other countries, competitor countries, industrial countries, and that this is starting to have an effect on the German manufacturing base. He's also made the point that it's causing pressure on Germany's finances because they're trying, despite the fact that this is inconsistent with EU rules, to support their manufacturing base through subsidies, which is a disastrous route to follow, by the way. I mean, it's it's ultimately a self-defeating exercise. You're, you're, you're distorting your own economy by providing subsidies and weakening your underlying financial uh, base. But again, that's what they're going to do. And so Germany's sagging. He made the point that the U.S. is in a better position because um, their energy system is more resilient. They produce much more natural gas. They produce oil. But by the way, on that, I saw a report in Zero Hedge this morning that natural gas output in the United States is now also starting to fall because it's all based on shales. And as we know, shales only have a limited life. But anyway, that's that's a problem, no doubt, for the medium to long term. In the meantime, we go on imposing still more sh sanctions. We have to impose sanctions. We have to go on imposing sanctions, because if we don't go imp on imposing sanctions, then as leaders in the West, 
we have to admit that sanctions have failed. The media is starting to admit that. The, po the politicians can't. So they are trapped in this narrative that they've created for themselves. And in the meantime, the IMF has just upgraded its growth predictions for the Russian economy this year. It said it would achieve 0.3% growth. It now says it will achieve 0.7% growth. In fact, the uh, Russian economics ministry now predicts that it will be well over 1%. And so I guess, you know, the politicians, they're not going to get harmed by these sanctions. And so for them, they uh, they understand that if they stop with uh, with these sanctions, then it's an admission of defeat. While at the same time, as long as the people of, you know, let's just say the UK or or Germany, as long as the people don't really uh, create much of a much of a fuss or stir with the fact that their living conditions have uh, have been degraded from from all of these stupid sanctions. For them, I guess it's a no lose. I, you know, they'll they'll see next election cycle what happens. But right now, they I guess they're they're rationalizing it as you know we're not affected by these sanctions. The people who are affected by these sanctions are citizens. They're not really causing much of a of a stir about what's going on. So you know we're all good to to go with an eleventh and a twelfth and a. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, package, whatever. We, we are in a situation of perverse incentives. And I think this is the thing people do need to understand. If you are a political leader in Europe and you have ambitions, you want to rise in the political structure, you want your cushy job in NATO, in the EU, at the European Central Bank, in one of those institutions, you support sanctions. You, you support sanctions, however bad the situation for Europeans becomes with sanctions. Because, of course, if you oppose sanctions, even if you are proved completely right in the short, medium, long term, well, you have broken with the rest of the political class and they won't forgive you and they will marginalise you. So you will therefore go on supporting sanctions, however bad the situation gets, because if you do the opposite, well, it might be better in theory for your people if you're talking the truth, but it will be bad personally in career terms for you. So this is, as I said, we're into the situation now of perverse incentives. Um, we, we've discussed this many times, that failure in the EU is the guarantee of success. <laughs> or rather, if you like, ideological purity is the guarantee of success, regardless of whether you fail or not. The more you fail in a kind of way, provided you maintain the course, the more people will support you because the more they feel they can trust you to stick with the kind of course that we see. So, you know, that's why Christine Lagarde rises, why Ursula is going to go from the EU to NATO, because even though she was a disastrous defence minister in Germany, she's the obvious person to run NATO, because as president of the EU Commission, she's shown her total loyalty to the Euro-Atlantic project. So there's no incentive for these people to change course. There's every incentive personally for them to stick with it. Yeah. What do you make of uh, of Hungary's recent moves to to build a pipeline with Serbia and to uh, to talk about how the EU is is just a complete failure? Well, the sanctions I mean, the have failed, and the san and the EU has not brought peace. And so, what's what's the purpose of having an EU? That it's was pretty the, it's, much what Orban said. I know well, he's the only country left, it seems to me, within the EU where that kind of thing, uh, that kind of language is now taught, can now be uttered. And I have to say, um, if Orban maintains his position and if he retains a sort of solid position within Hungary, I wonder how long Hungary can remain a member of the EU. 
I mean, I, I can actually see a situation where if the EU Commission, the EU leadership, aren't able to engineer his removal in some way, they might decide instead to spit Hungary out. In other words, to engineer a situation where it's pushed out of the EU entirely. They may calculate that doing that will provoke an even st a stronger reaction from the sort of Europhiliac section of the Hungarian population, which is significant. And at the same time, that way, they lose the problem of, the, of a difficult member. Just, just saying. And, you know, you can see the pathway to that. First, they suspend Hungary's voting rights in the EU institutions. And then gradually they engineer a situation whereby, in effect, de facto, and perhaps even fully, Hungary finds itself outside. Um, now, the relation, the, 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 these ideas of linking up with Serbia are very intriguing. Um, they will do everything they possibly can at the EU and NATO level to stop it. They might succeed. The, you know, they're, they're in a very powerful position to block these moves. There's pressure on Serbia all the time. There's pressure on Hungary all the time. In Serbia, from what I can understand, it's starting to provoke a backlash. And you're starting to see Serbs becoming increasingly um, critical of their government for being too soft towards the EU. There's been apparently protests. I don't pretend I'm fully up to speed with what's going on in Serbia, but that's what I understand. So it could be that you know, there is a consolidation, Serbia, and Hungary, and perhaps in time other countries. But they will, do, they will pull every stop to stop that happening. They might want to spit out Hungary, but they certainly will not want a block of European states starting to emerge outside the EU which is hostile to the EU, uh, which would start to look likely if Hungary and Serbia form this grouping together. Yeah, in, uh, in Serbia, it looks like we're going to have uh, snap elections. That's how it looks. Yeah. It looks yeah. like the Vucic government is going to call elections. And uh, it's, it's because they've been too accommodating to, uh, yes. to the EU and NATO, too yes. soft. Yes. Uh, with the EU and NATO and then the Serbians, uh, there is a large portion of, of the Serbian population that doesn't want the, the direction of, uh, of EU integration yes. and NATO yes. um, integration. Um, the, the plan, the final question, the plan to, to prevent oil from reaching the ports of Europe, I imagine they're talking about refined Indian oil uh, yeah. is what they're, they're talking about. How is this going yes. to affect the price of oil. Well, it's going, to, it's going to increase the price of oil, obviously, because, I mean, you know, if you're going to deny yourself oil from one source, that inevitably is going to result in disruptions within the oil uh, market, which inevitably is going to feed through into a higher price. All that will happen, I want to stress this again, all that's going to happen is that you're going to see even more of these schemes starting to work through people mixing oil from different sources uh, um, um, putting oil from one from Russia combining it with oil from you know some other country moving it around ships changing the names of the ships I know this can happen by the way despite what people say so it's probably not going to reduce the amount of oil that gets traded but it's going to increase the cost of doing it. And that will inevitably lead through to a higher price. It's inevitable. It's crazy. All right. Uh, anything else that you want to add with this? Or Well, it's crazy stuff. It, show, it, it is crazy stuff and it shows how completely detached from economic reality, but also from the roots of their societies the political classes in europe uh, especially have now become and this is dangerous it's it, i've said this many times it is not sustainable if you pretend that europe is still stands for democracy 
you can't continue to run what you call a democracy as in a way that is anti-democratic in the way that is being done at the moment. Um, it's going to create a dissonance which is ultimately going to become overwhelming. It'll take time. A lot of damage will be done in the meantime. And it's going to mean that the collapse, when it comes, is going to be even worse than it would otherwise have been. All right, uh, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rockfin, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. And go to Duran Shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.